Ayala learning Knichtas. Welcome to this series of videos in which we will explore the cultural contacts between early New England, Northern Africa, and the Middle East. With these videos, we hope to give you some interesting examples of intercultural contact between the East, the West, and the early Middle Ages. When you think of English-Arabic contact in the Middle Ages, your first thought might be the Crusades, a series of military campaigns that saw Western knights, including the English king Richard the Lionheart, travel to the Middle East to win back Jerusalem and the Holy Land from Muslim rulers, like Salah ad-Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, the Sultan of Egypt. In this video, we will show you that even before the Crusades, people traveled from England to the Middle East, and at this did not necessarily involve violence. But first, we will start the video by giving you some examples of early medieval long-distance travelers, hailing from both England and the Middle East. Next, we will look at an Arabic description of Britain from the 9th or 10th century. And we will conclude by tracing the journey of an Anglo-Saxon pilgrim, Willibald, through the Middle East. Pirates at sea, highwaymen on land, high mountains, scorching deserts, bad weather conditions, unknown languages, and unfriendly locals. These are but some of the many obstacles facing long-distance travelers in the early Middle Ages. Still, making long journeys was more common than you might think. And we have plenty examples of early medieval folks undertaking long and arduous journeys. Their reasons for doing so included trade, religion, and diplomacy. By way of example, here are some long-distance travellers connected to the court of the famous King Alfred the Great of Wessex. For starters, King Alfred himself was one of many Anglo-Saxons that went on a pilgrimage to Rome to meet the Pope. At his own court, Alfred also welcomed many traders and travellers, including the trader Othara, who had travelled all the way to the White Sea to the northwest of present-day Russia, and Wolfson, who had sailed to Terso in present-day Poland. Travelling even further from Alfred's court, the Anglo-Saxons Siegehelm and Athelstan were sent all the way to India on a pilgrimage. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, this happened by order of Alfred himself in the year 883. While Anglo-Saxons thus did their fair bit of travelling, the real long-distance travellers of the early Middle Ages set out from the Middle East. They include some very famous ones that you may have heard of. Our first example is Ibn Fadlan, a 10th century Baghdadi traveler who's world famous for his account of witnessing the funeral of a Viking chieftain near the Volga River among the Rus. Another famous Arab traveler was Sulaiman al Tajir, a merchant who traveled all the way to China in the 850s. And it wasn't just humans doing the traveling. One other Middle Eastern traveler that cannot go unmentioned was Abul Abbas, the diplomatic elephant who went from Baghdad all the way to Aachen, Germany. This elephant was a diplomatic gift for Charlemagne, sent by the Abbasid Caliph Harun al-Rashid. While medieval Arabs are known for their wide traveling, we do not know whether any Arab traveler ever made it as far as England. However, we do find one interesting description of early medieval Britain among the writings of an Arab geographer, as we will show you in the next part of this video. Medieval Arabic writings include various geographies, description of faraway places. Some of these places had been visited by the authors themselves, while the description of other places are clearly based on second-hand information. Description of Britain typically fall in the latter category, and usually merrily mention that Britain is a faraway land, surrounded by a lot of water. The most elaborate description of Britain in an early medieval Arabic work is found in a text by Ibn Rostai. Ibn Rosta was a 10th century Persian explorer and ge geographer, and in his Kitab al Nafisa, Book of Precious Records, he preserved a description of Britain that he attributed to Harun ibn Yahya, a Syrian traveller who lived around the year 900. His description of Britain reads as follows. وتملك عليها سبعة من الملوك وعلى باب مدينة صنم إذا رام الغريب أن يدخلها 
النام فلا يمكنه دخوله حتى يأخذ أهل المدينة فيقفوا على مخزاء ومقصدة في دخول المدينة وهم قوم نصارى وهم آخر بلد الروم وليس وراها عمران And from there, the land of the Franks, you walk and travel four months until you reach the city of Britain. It is a big city situated on the coast of the Western Ocean and seven kings reign over it. And at the city's entrance, there is an idol. If a stranger wanted to enter it, the city, he sleeps outside and cannot enter until the people of the city find out his intentions of entering the city. They are Christian people and they are the last land of the Romans and there is no civilization beyond them. This passage is puzzling for a number of reasons, which make it unlikely that Ibn Yahya had ever visited Britain himself. For starters, there is the curious statement that the capital of Britain is about four months traveling away from the land of the Franks, which seems to suggest a rather slow pace, even by medieval standards. Second, there is the notion that seven kings ruled over Britain, which, as historian Caitlin Green has pointed out, is likely connected to the political tradition of the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy, the division of England into seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, a situation that would have predated Ibn Yahya by more than a century. And lastly, it is unknown what idol Ibn Yahya was referring to, nor do we have any evidence of strangers being forced to wait or sleep outside the gates of early medieval English cities. Even though it is, of course, possible that the British national sport of queuing has a really long history. So, Ibn Yahya never really visited Britain himself, but may have based his description on written sources, or hearsay. At any rate, Arab geographers were certainly aware of Britain's faraway existence, and those who read Ibn Yahya's description in Ibn Rostah's work would at least imagine Britain as a slightly inhospitable place where strangers were forced to sleep outside. We could make a Brexit joke here, but we won't. While we may not have any concrete examples of early medieval Arabs traveling to England, we do have one extensive account of someone who traveled the other way, an Anglo-Saxon pilgrim in the Middle East. In this part of the video, we will trace the steps of Willibald, an 8th century Anglo-Saxon pilgrim whose travels to the Middle East have been recorded in quite some detail. The description of Willibald's life and travels was written by a nun named Hugeborg, who lived in Heidenheim, Germany. Hugeborg had taken notes from all the stories that Willibald had told her and his other followers, back in the days when Willibald was a bishop in Eichstadt, Germany. Her text is known as the Hodo Eporicon of St. Willibald. And as you can see on this map, the text describes Willibald's travels in quite some detail. In the year 721, Willibald set out from England and spent the next 10 years traveling through France, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Syria, and the Holy Land. During this time, he visited all sorts of holy places connected to the life of Christ. Hugeborg's Hodo Eporicon of St. Willibald makes for interesting reading and demonstrates that in the Middle East, Willibald and his fellow pilgrims were met with a combination of suspicion and kindness. For instance, the text relates how Willibald got detained by Saracens when he reached the town of Emesa, which would be modern-day Homs in Syria. The locals believed him to be a spy, and so they bound Willibald's hands and brought him before a certain rich old man, who started to question him to find out what he was up to. After Willibald explained that he was a pilgrim from England, the old man revealed that Willibald was not the first Englishman he had seen. I have often seen men coming from those parts of the world, fellow countrymen of theirs. They cause no mischief and are merely anxious to fulfill their law. Thanks to the kindness of the rich old man, Willibald and his companions are released and travel on to Jerusalem. But not for long. Once they get to Jerusalem, they're once again imprisoned by the local governor, who thinks they are spies. Fortunately for Willibald and his companions, they're not treated too harshly during their imprisonment. A local merchant takes pity on them and regularly sends them supper and dinner and even arranges for them to take occasional trips to the local bathhouse. Not too bad a treatment for a potential spy. Eventually, Willibald and his companions are brought before the king of the Saracens, who's called Emir al Muminin in the text, an Arabic title that literally translates to Commander of the Faithful, which is normally given to the supreme leader 
of an Islamic community. Having heard their story, this emir also releases Willibald and his fellow pilgrims from their bonds, stating, Why should we punish them? They have done us no harm. Allow them to depart and go on their way. Now that it had finally been established that Willibald was not a spy, Willibald freely travelled around the Middle East for a number of years. He saw marvellous places and also appears to have made some good friends. Hugeborg reports that on one occasion, Willibald was travelling with a man from Ethiopia. They were walking along some olive trees when suddenly a roaring lion jumped out onto the road, its mouth wide open, ready to seize and devour them. The Ethiopian said, Have no fear, let us go forward. Then, much to the lion's surprise, the travellers continued along their way, past the lion, who left them unharmed. Phew! Another one of Willibald's travel stories revealed that, while he may not have been a spy, he definitely was a smuggler. When Bishop Willibald was in Jerusalem, he bought himself some balsam and filled a calabash with it. Then he took a hollow reed, which had a bottom to it, and filled it with petroleum and put it inside the calabash. When they reached the city of Tyre, the citizens arrested them and examined all their baggage to find out if they had hidden any contraband. But when they could find nothing but one calabash, which Willibald had, they opened it and snuffed at it to find out what was inside. And when they smelled petroleum, which was inside the reed at the top, they did not find the balsam which was inside the calabash underneath the petroleum, and so they let him go. Having avoided prison for a third time, Willibald eventually returned to Italy and spent 10 years in a monastery of Monte Cassino in Italy before moving to Eichstadt, Germany, where he was ordained a priest, became a bishop and built a monastery. It is at this monastery that he tells Hugeberg and his followers about his many adventures on the road. Judging by Hugeberg's appraisal of Willibald at the end of her Hodo Apuricon, he made quite an impression on her. What shall I now say of Willibald, my master and your devoted brother, who was more outstanding than he in piety, more perfect in humility, who more forbearing in patience, more strict in temperance, greater in meekness? When was he ever backwards in consoling the downcast, who was more eager to assist the poor and more anxious to clothe the naked? Wow, Willibald, more like Willy Bay. No. And so we've reached the end of this video. Even in the early Middle Ages, people travelled long distances on foot, by boat, on a horse, camel or an elephant. Just like us, when medieval people travelled abroad, they encountered distant lands, made new contacts, had life-changing experiences and learnt new skills. We hope you too have learned something from taking this journey with us, even if it's just the many things you can use a calabash for. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other videos on cultural contact between early medieval England, North Africa and the Middle East. This video was made possible by Leiden University's Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Fund.